All right, so here's a problem. We have a, we have a large data set, for example, a, a collection of images, and we want to build a generative model that captures the structure in this data set. Hopefully one that will generalize to produce new images that we haven't seen before. So how do we go about doing this? Well, if we have enough data, oh, there we go. If we have enough data, we might want to parameterize this generative model as a neural network and learn the parameters. So we could assume that every image, x, is an independent sample from the same distribution, and we could describe that distribution via some latent variable, z. So for each image, z might be a vector, and then we, we have a decoder network parameterized by theta, which transforms z into the image, x. So the goal is to do maximum likelihood learning. Maximize the probability of the entire data set under our model, where we marginalize out over all of these z's. And we want to learn this decoder network, which is for the likelihood, p of x given z, and maybe the prior over z is, is just a standard Gaussian distribution, or maybe the prior is something that we want to learn to. Either way, there are two things that make this difficult. Number one is that marginalizing over z, even for a single image, is completely intractable. It might be a hundred or a thousand dimensional continuous space. And number two is that the data set is huge. Just evaluating its marginal likelihood requires taking a product over thousands of images. And so in 2014, a few different authors independently came up with a very good solution to these two problems which is doubly stochastic variational influence. The idea is that we define a separate variational distribution for each z, say a Gaussian distribution, to serve as an approximate posterior. And we can use that approximate posterior to construct a lower bound on the marginal likelihood of the entire data set, the so-called evidence lower bound, or elbow, which involves a sum over all of the n images. And we want to do gradient descent to maximize this elbow, both for the parameters of the decoder network and for these Gaussian approximate posteriors. But the trick is that we never actually have to evaluate this messy integral in full, because for each gradient step, all we need is an unbiased estimate. And we can get that easily. We just pick a small sample of images, and for each image, we sample a single z from its variational distribution, and that gives us an unbiased estimate of the whole objective. So variational autoencoders are an extension of this idea, where instead of defining each variational posterior separately, we parameterize each of them as a function of the data that they're supposed to explain. So we have a single neural network which takes any x and returns a variational distribution over the values of z which could explain that x. And this means that to train our model, we just sample a mini batch of x's and run those x's through the encoder network to find the corresponding variational posteriors. So using a VAE brings a few advantages. First is that you only have to look at small mini batches of data at a time. And so it's possible to take small steps to train your model without looking at all of the data. Second is that once you have a trained model, you also have a trained inference network. So if you want to do inference on some unseen data, you can do it quickly without needing MCMC or something. And lastly, variational autoencoders give you a kind of bootstrap learning. Because every time you update the variational posterior for one data point, you also update it automatically for all of the other data points too. And so this means you might expect to learn a lot faster and also avoid getting caught up in local optima. So these are all great advantages of a VAE. And what's missing? Well, one thing that seems a little problematic is this very, this very first assumption we made, which is that all of the data at IID. If you look more closely at this particular data set, that assumption really doesn't seem to hold up. The data doesn't actually come as just a big collection of images. It comes as a collection of image classes. There's a, a car class and a boat class. And all of the images in each class look pretty similar. So really what it looks like is there's a distribution over kinds of image, and then each of these defines its own distribution over images. If we really understand the structure in this data set, we'd be able to not just generate new images, but to generate whole new classes, to invent, say, a new, a new kind of animal, and then generate lots of different variations of this animal. And so for that, we'd want a model like, like this, a hierarchical model, where we have not just a latent variable z describing each image, but another latent variable c describing each class. So there'll be one value of c for horses, one value of c for the, for the monkeys class, and again, c could be something like a vector with a Gaussian prior, and the probability of z given c could also be parameterized by a neural network. So that's one kind of data set structure that we'd really like to model. Of course, there are many more. Some data sets have a, have a nested class structure. So for example, I'm sure many of you have seen the Omniglot data set. It's a data set of handwritten characters, and it's organized into 50 alphabets where each alphabet has something like 30 characters, and each character has 20 images. So we'd like to model this kind of shared structure using a hierarchical generative model with a separate latent variable to describe the regularities in each, in each alphabet and in each character. It's also very common to have a kind of factorially structured data set, say images of different faces from different viewpoints. And we'd like to model the images as conditional on both the face and the viewpoint. So we might hope to have one latent variable to describe each of these 
and a neural network which combines them in order to produce an image. And then we could do things like render new images of the same face in different viewpoints, or we could sample entirely new faces, or we could try and classify a face given only an image of the back of the head. The point of this is that lots of data comes with some kind of data set structure that we'd like to incorporate into our, gener into our generative model. The more of this structure that we incorporate, the more different kinds of tasks we can ask the same model to do, and the more interesting directions it has to generalize in. So our goal is to find ways to train these deep generative models, keeping all of the great advantages that variational autoencoders afforded us, but doing away with this IID assumption. And a really terrific paper was published last year called Towards a Neural Statistician, aiming to do something just like this. They, they focus on training models of data sets that have a class structure. And the way they do it is to try and reframe the problem to be like training a variational autoencoder. So for that, they need all of the observations to be independent of each other, which obviously isn't true for Xs in the same class. And so to make that independence happen in the neural statistician, they essentially unroll this inner plate. So this is, this is showing all of the variables for one class. And then they regroup everything. So you can think of all of the images from a single class as comprising one observation, an observation of a set. And you can think of all of these Zs and the C as a single latent variable to describe that set. And now it looks just like a variational autoencoder, where X is a set and the latent variable has some structure to it. So in the neural statistician, they build a particular kind of inference network which can take a set as input, and they infer all of the corresponding latent variables, and then they just train on the standard variational autoencoder objective. Setting the problem up like this hits many of the criteria that I laid out, but it has one significant limitation, which is that we wanted to train using only small mini-batches of training examples at a time. With a neural statistician model, we can't just use one or a few individual images to make a gradient step. We need to use a complete class of images. For each class, we concatenate all of the images together, and then we run that class wholesale through, through both networks. And so the, the time and memory per iteration grows with the class size, which can easily make training on large data sets completely unfeasible. And so in practice, to get the neural statistician to work, they ensure that none of the classes are too large, because prior, prior to training, they'll take all of the images of, of, say, one handwritten character, and they'll split them up randomly. So they'll pretend that five of them make up one class, five of them make up another class, and so on. And the downside to doing this is that it's no longer a lower bound on the likelihood of the, of the true classes. And it turns out that using only a few images per class also really limits how powerful a generative model you can learn. I'll give some examples later of what happens when you try to train a neural statistician with, a, with an expressive pixel CNN likelihood. And so in this work, we aim to generalize the neural statistician in a way that lets us tackle these problems differently. Specifically, we'll construct a family of training objectives parameterized by some value, R, which can trade off between exactness and computation in a different way. At one end of the spectrum, we'll recover the neural statistician objective, which is close to the true likelihood, but which, which can't be used with large classes. And on the other end of the spectrum, we'll have an objective which scales very well to large data sets, but which is much more approximate. Importantly, though, unlike that subsampling trick I just mentioned, every training objective on this spectrum will still be a lower bound on the marginal likelihood of the full data set. And the way we're going to do this is to sample elements separately for inference and generation. So at training time, we first choose some element, k, to be our, our target image. And then we randomly sample a new subset of elements from the same class and feed those elements to the encoder network to infer the latent variable for that class. So it could, be, it could be these three, or these three, or these three. And so that r I was talking about, we'll call it the support ratio, is the number of elements we sample as a, as a fraction of the whole class. So once we've inferred C, we can just do the usual variational autoencoder thing. We use a second encoder network on the target image to infer Z, and then we use that to decode the target image itself. So we started with a random sample of images, and then we decoded a new image from the same set, and that's why we call it a variational homo encoder. And putting those pieces together, that gives us the, the variational homo encoder objective. It's a sum over all of the examples in the data set. And for each element, we have an expectation taken over this sampling procedure where the first two terms in this expectation are just the standard elbow for you use for a VAE. And the third term is another encoding cost for this class latent variable, C. And because there are n elements in the class, we scale this encoding cost down by a factor of n, which makes this objective into a lower bound on the marginal likelihood of, of the full data set. So that's the VHE. And in the time left, I'll give some results for a few modeling contexts in which it should be particularly useful. So the, the first is for structured data sets. We can train variations of the VHE for a factorial models such as this one. And to demonstrate this, we built a, a variant of the Omniglot dataset where we modified each image by applying randomly generated style to it, changing both the color and the pen stroke. 
And we then used these images to train a factorial generative model with one latent variable for the character and another latent variable for the style. So once it's trained, we can use the model to do a kind of style transfer, where we take one image and infer its style vector, and another image and infer its latent character vector. And then we combine these to render new images. And this works even when both the style and the character have never been seen before during training. So for each pair like this, we can render lots of different variations of the image. But of course, we can also just take one image to infer the content and then re-render it using a style sampled from the prior like this. It's also possible to construct a VHE with multiple levels of class structure. So we trained a hierarchical model like this on Omniglot with a separate latent variable for each alphabet and each character and each image. And then once it's trained, we can take an image of a character we've never seen before and pass it through the network to infer the character variable and then use that variable to sample new images of the same character like, like these. But also with the very same model, we can take a few different characters from an unseen alphabet and use them to imagine new characters in the style of that alphabet, like these. So, so these characters quite clearly capture some of the regularity you, you see in the alphabets. But one thing about all these images is they're actually quite blurry. And if we wanted to make the low level structure in these characters a bit cleaner, we might want to use a more powerful neural network. And it turns out that variational homoencoders are also very good for this, for training generative models that use very expressive functions like autoregressive networks as decoders. So just to back up, autoregressive models are expressive distributions for modeling data with some kind of sequential structure to it. For example, a WaveNet is a neural network that generates sound waves one sample at a time. And a Pixel CNN is a neural network that generates images one pixel at a time. And this means that Pixel CNNs can be very good at modeling complex distributions over natural images, which suggests they'd be perfect to use as the renderer in a latent variable model. But unfortunately, this is much harder to get working than you might expect. Pixel CNNs are actually too powerful, and they're so good at modeling complex data distributions that they don't need to rely on latent variables to capture most of the structure in the data set. And this often leads to latent variable models which are degenerate. They become unconditional with a likelihood that's completely independent of the sampled latent variable. With a variational homoencoder, we want the same latent variables to explain a very large number of data points, which shows up as this one over n factor in the encoding cost. And fortunately, this rescaling factor has the effect of allowing the class level latent variables to be used much more effectively. And so to show this, we, we developed an expressive generative model for images where the class latent variable C is a 3D tensor with a pixel CNN prior. And for generation, an affine transform is applied to this tensor, and then we render the result using a second pixel CNN. So here's what happens when we, we take this generic architecture and we train it on faces. On the left are five ground truth images of a particular celebrity. And in the center are five new images generated using the inferred latent variable. And we compare against the same network trained as a neural statistician shown on the right. So as you can see, that the VHE generates much more realistic samples, and it also makes about 25% fewer er errors in a five-shot classification task. So then we also applied exactly the same network architecture to handwritten characters. And when we train as the neural statistician, the model becomes degenerate. It learns a global distribution of characters with very little dependence on the latent variable. And so in one-shot generation, the network produces images which are realistic, but almost completely independent of the support image. And this, of course, means it does a very poor job of one-shot classification. By comparison, one-shot samples generated by the VHE generalize from the support image in, in natural ways. So we can generate sharp one-shot conditional samples. And of course, we can also generate realistic-looking images of newly imagined characters by sampling from our model unconditionally. In fact, it turns out that this generative model of Omniglot is state-of-the-art for, for deep learning. It gets a one-shot and five-shot classification accuracy significantly higher than other deep generative models in the literature. And it's even competitive with the best discriminative models trained explicitly for classification. And we also achieve state-of-the-art log likelihood results when taken together over all of the images in the data set. So as a final discussion point, I'd like to give an alternative view of the variational homoencoder. Nowadays, there are lots of models in deep learning that are trained directly for few-shot generation, usually by maximizing the likelihood of some query image given a support set. So generative query networks are one architecture for doing essentially this, and attention pixel CNNs are another. And so from one perspective, what we're doing with the VHE is we're starting with the neural network for few-shot generation, like this. And we take some hidden layer in the neural network, call it H, we add some noise to it, and then we call that hidden layer a latent variable, giving it an encoding cost in the objective. And so under this view, a variational homoencoder is a strategy for turning few-shot generative models into variational Bayesian ones. We upgrade the conditional generation to a posterior predictive inference. And in doing so, we learn an unconditional model of our data at the same time. And so that's the variational homoencoder. You might think of it as taking a variational autoencoder and extending it to work on more richly structured graphical models. 
or it's taking a few short generation model and turning it into a Bayesian posterior predictive. The VHE objective is a lower bound on the likelihood of the complete data set, and by varying the support ratio, we can tighten this bound in exchange for tractability. And lastly, the VHE has the advantage that it can be used to train latent variable models with powerful likelihood functions like pixel CNNs. And we showed this with, a, with an omniglot generative model that's state of the art for deep learning. So with that, I'd like to thank all my collaborators, Max, Andrea, Tommy, and Josh. And if you're interested in training a VHE, we've got clean, easy to adapt code on GitHub. And you can also talk to me at the poster today. Thanks for listening.